Hello and welcome to The Pledge. It's a hard life being the Foreign Secretary, travelling the world, being treated to banquets and the best hospitality a country can offer. But Boris Johnson thinks his working life would be that much easier if the taxpayer stumped up for a private plane to take him around the world. Brexit Force One, there it is, the sole plane in the fleet of Boris Airways, ready on standby to whisk our Foreign Secretary around the world to make it a success of our exit from the EU. And with Brexit's biggest supporter in the cockpit, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Coming up, Afwa says it's time we faced up to our history. Nick calls order on the criticism of the speaker. Uh, Carol says the UK isn't racist. And Rachel has Hollywood in her sights. Buying sex and advertising for it online should be illegal across the UK, according to a group of MPs who've called for a change in the law after research into sex trafficking showed an increasing number of pop-up brothels. But many sex workers say that criminalising the purchase of sex will leave them more isolated and make their jobs more dangerous. The number of women who are trafficked in the sex industry is said to be only about 6%. Now, let me be clear. That's 6% too many. But lower than this political storm would suggest. It's simply not true that most sex workers are dependent on traffickers. Uh, it's thought the pop-up brothels are emerging because police keep raiding and closing regular premises. Sex workers are being forced to move on. Banning a behaviour for which there will always be demand only serves to send it underground, which is precisely what empowers traffickers. This war on sex is even more futile than its twin, the war on drugs. It's time for the UK to regulate its sex industry. You see, I don't buy the idea that, that regulating it will, will mitigate the harm that comes with it. I think it's a cruel lie to say to prostitutes that regulating will keep you safe. Nothing will ever keep prostitutes safe because, because, because prostitution by its nature is violent. And, and I think it would be... How can any civilised society, any society that calls itself civilised, want to, want to regulate a profession that is all about violence against women? You know, this is, you know, so this is not... It's not a challenge, if, if you have... And, and uh, by the way, I agree with Magic. If you have someone who, perhaps through disability or whatever else might be, cannot find it easy to enjoy sexual relations, and a prostitute is there to fulfil oh. the need for that person, how is that? That, that, that might be a, a tiny well, bit. Let, let me. Well, listen. Let me. Never mind. Never mind what violent. I say. Let, let me also add. Nick's completely right. What about the incel movement? Involuntary celibates. If they did actually have access to regular sex. You know, legal regulation. Oh, do then you really think that's the around. girls who are being trafficked? No, that's but, the but customers I mean, they're going place, to. But there is no, listen, a place for Listen, pay, listen for to what a, a, a former sex worker and co and she's co founder of the Survivors of Prostitution organization. She's called Rachel Moran. She says, I believe if a prostitute wants to see prostitution legalized, it's because she's inured both to the wrongs of it and to her own personal injury from it. Ooh. She says, to be prostituted is humiliating enough. To legalize prostitution is to condone the humiliation and to absolve the those who inflicted it. it's an agonizing insult now that's from a prostitute herself who okay. has lived so this that's life from one right. prostitute let's hear from, let's like say that that is from, let's hear from another yeah. former sex worker yeah. paris lees who's also a journalist i don't think that criminalizing sex work makes anybody safer um criminalizing the buying of sex work wouldn't have made me safer um i chose to do sex work as a student in brighton um if it had been illegal for the men who came to see me and paid for my time that wouldn't have stopped me doing it it just would have made them more desperate and, and, and paranoid and, and edgy it, it would have made me more desperate and, and less able to turn away people who were perhaps drunk or um, hostile now, I think it's also worth mentioning here that Lancet, a well-respected medical journal, mm -hmm. has published research that indicates that the uh, rate of STD transmission is lower in markets uh, that are regulated for sex work because, of course, that's it provides... The World Health Organization. That's right, as do the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. Supports it. Amnesty International has backed decriminalization okay. as well. And I think um, the studies we have so far do certainly indicate uh, that uh, crime is taken uh, further away from the equation when you that's regulate not because, that, of no, course, well, that, well, that's sex not the workers have recourse to the law. No, the, uh, there, the there is evidence that shows that when you decriminalise and regulate it, mm. the flow of women trafficked is increased. This is this is from the Coalition Against Traffic and Women yeah, in Australia, yeah, because yeah, what they're saying yeah. is the police oversight of that industry is much mm. reduced. Mm. And so, yeah. so where you would want it monitored, it isn't being monitored. Yeah. In any way, why do we want to regulate a profession that actually degrades and humiliates women? So Shouldn't we actually be... You say it's always been around. That's, I don't buy that the, argument the problem either, here, Carol, that is we that can't the, fight it. The, of course we the can. The trafficking is controlled by... Uh, 
gangs that also control drug trafficking. And so my argument rests on, the, um, on treating these two in a similar way, to recognise that regulating the drugs market and the sex work market together is what undermines the drugs trafficking, hold on, is what undermines the drugs trafficking gangs. If, for example, we take them in isolation, then of course you may well see the skewed result that you're referring to, because the gangs are still bringing in illegal quantities of drugs. But if you put in Carol what you'd like to see, because you clearly think prostitution is an inherently dangerous I don't and, 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 well, and it's not just me it's, it's women who no, I've got, I've got some it's sympathy dangerous. for you, of you. I don't no. agree with you defining prostitution as inherently violence against women but I agree well, I've got a lot of concerns about prostitution and it's not just trafficking if you look at the statistics um, up to three quarters of, of women who enter prostitution enter work before they're 18 yeah, exactly. and 70% exactly. up to 70% have been in care so there, there's lots to suggest that they're vulnerable women mm -hmm. my issue is at the moment we're criminalizing them rather than the men who pay for sex and here's a statistic for you of British men aged between 16 and 74, 11% have paid for sex. There are a huge number of but, men in our society. But think about this. If you, they if are the ones who should be as paying, as paying, as paying, paying for sex. sex. Still, I, I still find that a high statistic. That's if, by the way, uh, if paying for it. sex becomes normalised, yeah. what message are you sending well, out? That women are commodities. You're not normalising it. Wait a minute. You're criminalising it. You're criminalising We're talking about prostitutes. Sorry. But it's not just women who are prostitutes. There are also male prostitutes. Well, it's not just violence think, against women. Well, it's I violence mean, it's... against men too, and we've seen it. You know, yeah. we know this happens, and we but, know that that but, men abuse women who they we, use as pro they don't respect. Can we them. stop calling them. everything we disagree with violence? It's not violence well, to offend somebody. It's not violence to enter into it's a violence consensual. When you get hold on, please, assaulted. please hold on. It's not violence to enter into a consensual relationship, so long as we know it's consensual, which is what the purpose oh. of regulation would be for the children okay. you mentioned that enter into sex work. The best way to stop that is regulation I agree. just like with drug addiction this is not I think we've got to be be very careful and nuanced in the way we approach yeah. these subjects calling for regulation is not endorsing something it's calling for the well, thing you're to normalizing be, no it's also not normalizing no, you're regulating it's it. regulation okay. and legalization and decriminalization are specific terms tell me something you mentioned with, with the consensual market. sex work. Yeah, how yeah. do you think a prostitute is going to say, say if a man batters the, the hell out of her how is she offense. how is she going to be able to prove to the police or to a court that she didn't consent to that. How is she going to, to prove being that? That's because it's a criminal offence. To be raped. Right. Women sent to not a defence to rape. Carol, that that argument. Well, that okay, argument let me tell you. Let me let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, let me tell, let me tell you how we got from prostitution to rape. Dating women as well. Quote from from Inna Shevchenko, who's president of the Femin International Association. She says it's not possible. She's president of the Femin International Association. She says it's not possible to protect someone whose source of income exposed them to the likelihood of being raped on average once a week. But the whole That's point how we get of this debate, Carol, is about how you protect the women you who can't sell protect sex. Women the whole point is, at the moment, it is inherently, it is often an inherently violent mm. profession because it's it's criminalised, because women can't approach the authorities, because they face being raided and persecuted, and they, when they experience violent assaults and rapes, are currently not able to seek protection from the law. That's the situation yeah. that I think Majid okay. is trying to yeah. Yeah. Um, suggest could Isn't be changed that... by these. And, and at the moment, yeah. street work is the most violent form of prostitution yes, it is and that yeah. is what so i've been to, that's what you remove if i've you done regulate some reporting it. on this i went yeah. to leeds where they created a managed area so they took an area of leeds and said this is a managed zone for prostitution prostitutes within this area will be safe there will be health workers who will come in there will be police they can build a relationship with knowing they won't be persecuted and this is something that's been tried in other countries and how did it work in leeds it, I went out with, with health workers who were giving yeah. these women health care and contraception and there was a relationship being developed. The concern was that outside the rep managed area, yeah. um, other prostitutes were still operating underground and that they were increasingly more vulnerable. Why would you not, if you were a bloke, go to the managed area? It would seem to make sense you go to... Because also there's the health aspect, isn't it? Then the, typically girls, not always appropriate, but mostly girls will have the health checks, which has got to be a positive thing the as well, right? The problem is that it's still in a climate where they're still, it's still criminalised, right? So, so men yeah, still don't, have, yeah. don't feel comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. about yeah. buying sex yeah. and so you kind of I don't think any piecemeal reform See, works you, I, you have to deal Amsterdam with it on a macro scale last oh, night yeah. so this is what's driving this debate yeah. no, so, yes. and, and, and honestly 95% of the sex workers in Amsterdam are self-employed um, and uh, they regulated the industry in 2000 I think one of the ways to do so is to uh, allow for premises upon which sex work 
can operate from while not allowing it to uh, to curb crawl, not allowing it to be on the yeah. streets in that way, to solicit on the streets. And that, that's the difference between what I saw happen in Amsterdam and what I saw happen in Geneva. In Geneva, it's literally on the, you're walking down the road and people are soliciting you. There's a way to do it where, um, where it, there, it's in safe, regulated premises that will be subjected to regular inspection, where there will be unions protecting the rights of sex workers, as there are currently in the Netherlands. In the same way legalising drugs will not stop the traffickers of drugs, it will not stop traffickers okay, of women. Okay, it's time to move on yeah. uh, to another controversial topic to which I am no stranger. Mm -hmm. And it's no exaggeration when I say there are few issues as divisive as the one I'm about to raise next. All over the world, statues are coming down. In just the last couple of weeks, New York has removed from Central Park the statue of a doctor who tortured enslaved black women. India has brought down Lenin and Canadians have defaced statues of Queen Victoria. In Britain, Bristol has agreed to rename its famous music hall, removing the name of Edward Coulston, one of the nation's most prolific slave traders. Now it's time to take a long, hard look at other hugely problematic figures we continue to glorify, such as Horatio Nelson, oh, Cecil God. Rhodes, oh. and yes, Winston Churchill. I'm not oh. saying we should necessarily bring them down, Take a deep breath, everyone. You did but originally. all options should be on the table. As the global movement to re-question our so-called heroes shows, the thing that's clear is this. Doing nothing, burying our heads in the sand, and hoping this debate will go away is simply no longer an option. <laughs> Hi, Nick. Afwa. Afwa. <laughs> I really like you, but I wonder if I can remind you of some words you wrote yes. concerning Britain. Please do. Britain. We have moved on from this era no more than the US from its slavery and segregationist past. The difference is that America is now in the midst of a frenzied debate on what to do about it, whereas Britain, in our inertia, arrogance and intellectual laziness, is not. I don't write I bad, do uh, I? <laughs> well, you could have been a bit snappier, but I won't worry about subbing it. Um, <laughs> I'm delighted you do. Why do you stay in this country? If you take such offence when you see Nelson's column, if you take such offence when you hear Winston Churchill's name, who I would argue, if in the unlikely event that anybody want to have a poll, I would say probably 80 to 90 per cent of mm. people would say that Winston Churchill did a good thing. I'm delighted that I see you at these Thursdays. I'm delighted you opt to stand. But if it offends you so much, how do you manage to stay here? I find that a really strange thing to say. So there's nothing in Britain that bothers you. Sure, but I don't so want to pull it down. So why is leaving an option? But I don't want this to pull is it my down. country. This, and the reason that I raise this critique but is not so because I hate your... Britain. It's because I care about this country. I actually care about our honesty, our ability to move forward into a progressive future. I care about it. Otherwise, I would just leave how and leave it, it to you. How is it honest to decide to bring down Nelson's column or to do away with the Churchill war rooms or to change I'm the not... name of a concert? Is that the biggest problem that people who have a, a non-white people have in Bristol, the name of the town hall or the concert hall or whatever it is, that's their biggest problem? Actually, it is a big problem. Really? You know why? So, no, I'm a black you know woman why? in Bristol and I'm concerned you know, about Colston Hall. There's a councillor in, in Bristol who I was talking to recently um, called Cleo Lake who is of West Indian heritage and her school was named after Colston and every day they have this celebration where they celebrate Colston. Every and when day? She, every day, every year they have a big Colston day, sorry, <laughs> that, would, that would be a lot. Well, even I might say. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> and she was telling me how when she found out the history, she felt it to her core and she raised it with her teachers. And okay, she said, so let wait, just let me finish. Yeah. Why do we glorify this man? Yeah. He was the but kind of person who sold and enslaved before and Before I yield to Manchester. magic, before... And they I'll, wouldn't, they wouldn't I'll listen just, to her. And that affected, I, I, that was, affected her to her core. It affected her education. It affected uh, her confidence I because she knew something before I yield. that was being Afro, denied. I would imagine you're in support of statues to Gandhi. No, not necessarily. You don't in want fact, in Ghana, which is where my mum's from, they've removed right. Gandhi Nelson because Mandela? he was racist. Are we happy with statues? Well, it's funny you should say that because I made a documentary in which we questioned Nelson Mandela as well. <laughs> That's not the right. question he asked, though. No, can I, no, can I, my, can I just make yeah. this clear? Because so you're all, we, I know what you're all going to say. I am saying we should be debating the way we look at history. No, I'm not saying only white men. Well, why, no, why? I'm oh, saying no, history can be But it just so happens that a lot of white men did a lot of bad things we never talk about. I've been waiting patiently. We only talk about. Well, I'm really curious because. Uh, let's take Churchill. I mean, uh, you know, obviously a lot of the controversy around Churchill's historical record applies to what he did in South Asia with the Bengali famine and so on and so forth. And I don't think it's uh, anyone here is suggesting that we remove references to that in history. I think the question is when looking at historical figures, uh, what we're celebrating about them, for example, if they happen to have saved our very civilization, then there may be something worth celebrating for. What I'm really confused at, having 
you know, coming from the heritage that should be offended at Churchill's record in South Asia, I can recognize he saved our country. What I'm really confused at is when we spoke about Winnie Mandela, and I raised the issue of the fact that she was a, a fan of necklacing, a fan of burning, Just explain what necklacing burning, is. People, way, burning people to death. Uh, for, uh, on the mere accusation that they were collaborators in the shanty towns in South Africa. You were very happy to not only argue in her defence, but write a column defending her legacy as somebody that fought apartheid. So shall I explain? I, I, you've explained it before, so allow so me to... Uh, so I know, but allow me to, allow me to <laughs> tell you where I have a problem with your explanation, because that'll be more concise, you can respond to it. You, you talked about power structures and how you're about tearing down power. I'm not and about I, tearing down power, I'm about I imagine, correcting on, the record. Yeah, that, yeah, I'm correcting about rebalancing the, record, right. the narrative. But, but actually, in South Africa, Winnie Mandela had all the power, and those people she burnt to death had no power she had all and the no power. defense. When she was arrested well, she and held in solitary no, no, isolation no, 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 by no, the apartheid no, no. authorities, Afro, how you're still you... We haven't I'm got time to debate Winnie Mandela. I'm talking about okay. the fact that she was burning people to death. She they had denied no power. that, and actually well, the victims well, no, that, who she's alleged to be. Isn't that we're getting off topic? Just before we move on, let's just hear a clip, because this is exactly what we're talking about, and then, Carol, you will come in. Okay. This is from a documentary I've made on this very subject, which is going out on Channel 4 next week. <laughs> this is probably the place where you can best see how Britain thinks about its military history over the last 200 years. It's the great, glorious, imperial history. What is interesting, I think, is how unquestioning it is. It's just, we won, here's the monument, good for us. There's no mention of the victims on the other side, and there's no thought of who caused all this. That is not some loony lefty, that's Neil McGregor. Okay. So, there, and, and historians agree that we have erased a huge okay. part Histori of the okay. can, can we, can we yeah. remind us? Historians don't can agree be, on anything. Yeah. Statues agree on that. can be a reminder of our past good and bad. Let's talk, you know, briefly about, you know, and, and statues are, they're, they're not always built to comfort or console mm. or to honour. They can, they can be a salutary warning. Now, you know, there's nothing about the Confederacy that was noble. Its raison d'etre was slavery. But there is something, there is something very noble and necessary about a free people preserving its history and knowing who they are, where they come from and how they should be living now. And I think that's really important. Statues don't always glorify people. However, in the case of Churchill and the case of Nelson, I think they absolutely should. And yeah, I think, as Nick says, 80, 90 percent of people yeah. in this country yeah. would. Yeah. So, so, but I just, I don't, yeah. I think some of the Confederate statue. Let me, can I just read you a quote yeah. from Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., who said in 1884, he said, "I believe from the bottom of my heart that our memorial halls, statues, tablets, tattered flags are worth more to our young people by way of chastening and inspiration than the monuments of another hundred years of peaceful life could ever be." Mm. I think that's absolutely true. A statue doesn't have to be can pulled down. It can be there as a chase. It's the key to what I'm saying, uh, before you say this, Rachel, just because I feel like you both have said something and I haven't had a chance to correct it. <laughs> well, I am saying, what I'm talking about is correcting the record, right? So imagine you, you said... You don't have to. No, imagine people said, know their history. Imagine mentioned the Bengal famine. Our history how many British can, people, yes. Look, how many British Afra, people do you think please, know about can the Bengal famine? No, no, no. Yes, come in, Look, come in, Rachel. You cannot correct and history. change the past. It's not no. changing the past. It's the past. changing what we say about it. We don't know about the past in Britain. We don't know about the past. Afwa. The, pro the point is, is that this is where we are. This is how we have got to the point we are. We yeah. can't go back exactly. and delete and correct yeah. according to today's saying, norms and today's morals exactly. and today's thinking. Teaching the the fact, that is the what, opposite of what I'm the saying, problem is, No, you, you're not. You're, you're saying that we have to make the past appropriate I'm not, to the that, present. That is the opposite we can of never what I'm saying. Do that. The absolute opposite. Yes, you are, because no, you're saying we must saying. question the fact that no. we're putting on a pedestal, what the men I'm that I now, we now find okay. reprehensible. And the reason for questioning part, it is because we're looking at their past. Now, listen, well, but is, if we wait, talk about... Hold we on, talk about Churchill, please, can I We finish? talk about him winning Afra, the war and Afra, saving Afra, us from the Nazis, stop it and we talk... Second. Just Afra. let me finish, because you are... You've got a documentary you going said, I can just say one You've just said thing. the opposite of what my let, argument let is, Rachel. Let just finish her point. Rachel's point is a misunderstanding. I find it deeply... I am as liberal as the next man. I find this deeply upsetting and also almost insulting. That's because you misunderstand no, what I'm No, I'm not. And I fear that you're taking mm. this country down the path of when ISIS goes into Palmyra and ro knocks down temples, goes through, yeah, rampages right. through museums yeah, like in what, Mosul. Or like because, what Britain did in the because, Empire, destroying no, people's statues and histories and palaces. You cannot decide just because a culture has some unwelcome baggage that you dump the baggage because yeah. it's no longer yeah. useful on your yeah. journey. Can I we have the baggage. Can I speak now? I want to say something. Right. 
<laughs> First of all, I'm not saying, and I said clean my intro, we should necessarily take them down. This is what I want, a debate. And the reason I want that is because we don't Leading have it, where? Rachel. And the, re you know, the reason this is not a... I am the opposite of trying to erase our history. I want us to know our history. So when we look at Churchill, I would like people to know about using aerial policing in Mesopotamia and not distinguishing between civilians. And I would like people to know about three to four what million about, people what, dying. What about the as things well, really famous As well as winning Like the war. defeating Hitler. Exactly. Like saving the country. Already like saving Western, Western, Western democracy. Like saving more when Jews from being extreme. When we talk about... Nelson, I want us to remember yeah. the Napoleonic yeah. Wars. I want to remember the existential victory against the French. And if he wasn't I on that also, pedestal, Napoleon. 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 So so to to remember, to say, to... We only know one side. This, this is about bringing well, you're the assuming that we guys, there seems to be a reasonable... We don't guys, 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 please, there seems to be a reasonable way forward here. If what I'm hearing you say now is about education, let's talk about the sure. curriculum and what's being taught in right. schools and a, uh, a multi-dimensional approach to history, which is fantastic. Let's not talk about tearing statues down. And also, actually, in terms of statues, what they did in Oxford with Rome, uh, there's another way forward as an alternative here as well. We can leave the original statues up, and there's plenty of and space discuss. in this country. The statute of limitations has run out, oh. and the statues <laughs> debate we move on. Very good. Clever, clever. And now for something completely different. In truth, not just different. Real, knock me down with a feather and call me Nancy, unblooming, believable. I find myself supporting someone I've seen in the past as a shrill, pious irritation. No, I'm not referring to Afwa and her demand to level <laughs> Nelson's column, turn the area into a botanical garden celebrating the flora and fauna of Africa, nor mm. Rachel's loopy Lib Dem lunacy. Rather, I Oi. find myself defending the impossibly pompous common speaker, John Burko. Now, let me be candid. I think he needs to honour his promise and go later this year, as he vowed to do on his election, and an investigation into claims of bullying, which he denies is a necessity. However, to be investigated for using the word stupid to describe a cabinet minister is absurd. The Commons, like many other workplaces, is a robust place. Scarcely a day passes when the thought police, though, tell us what we are allowed to say or think. It's nuts. And anyone supporting this snowflakery is, well, stupid. <laughs> This is, I find this a bit of a difficult one. OK. The reason I find this difficult is, as you probably know, I have a zero-tolerance attitude towards bullying in the workplace. Sure. I think there should be no place for it. Yeah. I think we should be more willing than we have in the past to call it out. And I think that for a role like the Speaker, where you are responsible for discipline in the House, it is especially important that you have people's confidence that you are someone who behaves fairly and professionally. Yes. The thing... He denies any bullying. He just, denies just any bullying. That, yeah. I mean, this is a debate on using the word stupid. It is a debate on using yeah. the word stupid. I suspect that the reason it's being taken so seriously is because these other allegations of bullying, which haven't been proved, which he denies, are also in the mix. I also have a little sympathy for him in the context where he made that remark, because it was the government trying to abuse the rules to um, use time that well, should have been used for it. Grenfell as Tower yeah. to um, use, uh, make a government speech, which I can see why he was frustrated, and I can relate to that. But I think... I don't think we should be dismissive of this kind of thing. And I think you're belittling the idea of stupid, and it, it, it does sound a little bit trivial in the scheme of things, but I okay. think that it wasn't, for me, stupid. It was stupid woman. Yeah. It was the fact that he mentioned her gender and that, that there is a history of people okay. weaponising yeah. women's right. gender against them. Really grateful. I want to turn we, to Majid. Yeah, we just need to get in. Uh, the Speaker's office have made a statement on that, and they've said, Mr Speaker strenuously denies that there is any substance to any of these allegations. Mr Speaker has a superb team of dedicated, effective and long-serving staff, five of whom have worked for him very happily for a combined total of over 40 years. So that's the statement from the Speaker's mm. office. It was important to get that in yeah, there. That's regarding the, uh, the bullying. But uh, on, on the word stupid, um, I, I imagine he was talking about a woman, so I, I, I don't know if it's the fact that she was a woman that he called her stupid uh, uh, for, or perhaps just because he felt she was stupid. But I think well, sometimes it, it, in the yeah, it was a, wom a, a woman, right? So, so, so yeah. I think I think if he called her a stupid man, she may have taken offence because she's not a man. I mean, I know. I, yeah, I think the word stupid is a saying. very relatively mild form yeah, of, of arguing in the workplace. Hang on, let's just so, before before we go finish. I just want he's and, and and you know that, I, he's also responded to that to that word stupid specifically as well. Let's hear what he has to say. I used the word stupid in a muttered aside. That adjective simply summed up how I felt about the way that that day's business had been conducted. Anyone who knows the Leader of the House at all well will have not the slightest doubt about her political ability and her personal character. 
I love this House. I respect all of my colleagues. I hold you all in the highest esteem. I just worry that if we're not even allowed to use the word stupid in the context of a little <clears throat> spat at the workplace anymore, it becomes so censorious that we can't express our true feelings in, in a conversation. Carol, it's just tough, you know? Carol, um, this became a story because of the allegations, which we have to make clear, that he has denied. He has a reputation for this. News and I did a report last year from his office, uh, also his, his old private secretary, Angus Sinclair, who resigned in 2010, was paid off not to speak about this, then did speak and said he was a bully. Another lady from his office was there was asked to be moved because of mm. so-called bully which he denies we have to be clear on that but you know this isn't just any oh, workplace this is the house of commons where where the rules on politeness and respect are enforced ruthlessly but no let me, fin let me finish this point wait. by the thing and it was interesting that, that burkow himself two years ago introduced a 16 page guide let me tell you it was called the rules of behavior and courtesies in the house <laughs> and i'm pretty sure there wasn't there wasn't I a sidebar right part 55 that. Right. I'm a bit surprised to find you so passionate about this. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's get back to Rachel. I'm wondering Rachel, about your Rachel. motives. Um, oh, oh, well, yeah, I think we nice. saw from John Burko that he, you know, who does love the sound of his own voice. Yes, yes of course. Um, I think that was a pitch to keep his job a bit longer. I mean, my anxiety about this topic is that I sort of feel that people should be able to let off steam in the workplace. Yes. Yeah. And otherwise, what, you know, what they say in public to your face and what they say in private behind your back, there is such yes. a chasm mm. that I think it's rather unfortunate. I think that the lady in question actually responded rather well to what happened and she didn't take it serious. She didn't take it over seriously and I, she, okay. this was her just... response. As you said last week, Mr Speaker, we have a responsibility to safeguard the rights of this House. And as Leader of the House, I seek to do exactly that, treating all Members of Parliament with courtesy and respect. Yeah. I hope and expect all Honourable and Right Honourable Members to do likewise. Yeah. I, actually, you know, I, I've been extremely rude and unpleasant about Andrea Leadsom in the past, uh, in print, and I, uh, she's made me feel well, we would much better, much better yeah. to say it to her face and take can the I, consequences. Can I just remind you of another time that I feel w gender was a factor in condescending behaviour yeah. in the House? This is David Cameron. Calm yeah. down, dear. In 2011. Yeah. Down, dear. Who could forget it? Exactly. But he's now a GP. He says, Calm, calm down, dear. Calm down. Calm down. Listen. Listen to the doctor. Calm down and listen to the doctor. It makes just re-watching that it actually well, got can, me almost as annoyed as you guys. If on I my can just interrupt today. you for a moment, Ducky, it's quite. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Let's just play, because we're, we're a bit of a clip fest, but this, for me, sums it up about where your brother works, where we just saw David Cameron, where we saw everybody else, and a very respected politician, Ken Clark. If every time a member of this House has uh, felt moved to say under his breath something rather abusive about another member, <laughs> action was taken, the chamber would be deserted without <laughs> considerable... Uh, quantities of time. I, would you not agree it's best to leave this to the body that is now investigating it and perhaps hope that some common sense will be applied to this rather overheated subject? Yeah. Wouldn't Ethel, would you not agree with that? They, they'll, ne they'll never be able to do a day's work if we suddenly outlaw a word such as stupid. I think it's difficult. I agree. We need to be realistic about the, the reality they work in. On the other hand, they are supposed to set the tone. They're supposed to be the people we elect. They're supposed to be our and leaders. I, Come on, you can't can agree with it is, that. It is ironic that Andrea Letson, currently in her job as leader of the House, is... is looking at questions of whether Parliament is sufficiently well equipped to deal with bullying and with rumours after the Westminster <laughs> scandal. So it, it would actually, it, it just seems to me the ultimate irony. And maybe, maybe that's why he doesn't feel too well disposed to her. Seeing that clip of David Cameron there reminds me that the Speaker, otherwise known as Squeaker Burko, yeah. has had to put up with a lot of flack himself. And David Cameron once said, to, you know, he, John Burko said, I'm not happy. And then David Cameron said, well, which one of the seven dwarves are you then? Remember yeah, that? I do remember. <laughs> He's constantly being teased and belittled, literally belittled, for being of short, <laughs> of short stature. Yes. And, but do you not think stupid is a bit topic, respectfully, Rachel? Yes. It's whether you can use the word stupid is what we're discussing. Is, is it? Not... But do you not think? <laughs> oh, there, there aren't... But you and I, as columnists, we would, never, we would never be able to put a column out if we can't... We're, we're going to be fairly scathing about people. You're taking people. all the colour out of language, guys. Come yeah, on. I agree. That's yeah, what we're doing. We're not. making everyone bland automatons. Stupid. Or mad. It just happened to have been a woman. 
Well, John Burko has been driven to, to be to irritation himself because he's constantly yes. being teased about being little. Yeah, so yeah. when he says stupid woman, well, you know, well, sometimes he is people blow He up. is little. You can't dispute yeah. that, but she's I mean, not stupid. But she's a woman as well, isn't but, she? And she's not stupid. So but if, if you, someone if acts go... in what you perceived it... If, for instance, every time Maggie went on air at our radio station, he kept saying the wrong station or something like that, I'm perfectly entitled to say, he's a stupid bloke, you know, he really is. He can't even name the radio station. And he's not going to take offence at that because yeah. he's stupid not to be... Especially that if right? I said BBC instead well, of LBC. That would really be <laughs> the other thing he's alleged to have <laughs> said <laughs> denied was a lot worse than that. And you know, and I can't say it, but the other thing he's alleged to have said, so it wasn't just something... But that the investigation is about stupid woman, and, yeah. and that's, well, that's, is, what, yes. that's what it turns yes. on. If we can just pick on, which I think was actually one of the, the brightest points of the debate, when Majid says... <laughs> it's rare for Majid, let's be honest about it. Um, that you'll take <laughs> all the... Patronising behaviour. <laughs> <it's laughs> beautiful thought. You'll take all the colour out of the language you will effectively have to... That is true, is it not? That's what people said when, you, you know, when racial slurs stopped being oh. accepted in the workplace. No. Oh, you can't was have it? fun anymore. Just have... Not, no. like, look, in the well, 60s, language was normal, which now we find completely unacceptable. And every time it's killjoys and the political correctness... You're not stupid on the same level as N I'm not. or P, you know, you? as I've said, you it wasn't did. stupid for me. Well, it was the woman. Just, you just, no, you I'm not comparing the word. You just said stupid is like I'm the I'm not comparing the word. I'm comparing oh, okay. the idea you that if you, if you have rules about what it is and isn't acceptable to say, then you can't have fun at work anymore. I don't... I just don't buy that. Right. It's me up after the break, and I'm saying we're not a nation of racists. <laughs> Welcome back. Michael Gove made a speech this week where he said Britain had the warmest attitude to migration. He was ridiculed, laughed at, shouted down. The implication being that this country is inherently racist and treats migrants like dirt. We don't. We're one of the least racist countries in any mature Western democracy, and we're certainly the least racist in Europe. But anyone who dares to say that is accused of sticking up for the racists or being racist themselves. And then there was that, that wedding. Yes, it was joyous and uplifting, and Meghan looked incredible. But I'm sick of commentators peddling the notion that black Brits have been waiting for a dark-skinned duchess to make them feel British and feel better about themselves. And white Brits needed to see a mixed-race woman marrying Harry to realise that black people are acceptable. It's patronising and it's insulting. Yes, in a population of 65 million people, there will be racists, but this nation is not racist. And the Liberal elite defames and disrespects the people of this country by conflating those who simply want to control the numbers coming here with the minuscule numbers who do hate immigrants. Carol, I don't, I don't disagree with all you've said. Um, but, and I'm going to leave, um, I think, Meghan Markle bringing a mixed race blessings onto our country for, for someone else because what I want to what I want to talk about is the fact that it wasn't what he said but the fact that it was Michael Gove who said it and Michael Gove fronted the vote leave campaign which didn't have a dog whistle when it came to anti-immigrant sentiment it was a loud clarion call there were posters um, th threatening the arrival of 76 million Turks into your village and I'm you know they terrified me and I'm part Turkish that, you know, the fact is, is that he stoked fear of immigration throughout the campaign. And now to say, come in, the water's lovely, everybody, we are warm and but not a hostile and cold environment is frankly very rich because since the country voted to leave, as he suggested in those posters, there's been a spike in hate crime. Mm. But worse, our own Home Secretary, who is of Pakistani origin yesterday, gave a speech in which he detailed the anti-immigrant abuse that his brother gets on the streets, people shouting Paki at him. Mm. And this has happened since he's, you know, in the, in the recent time. But there's also been a poll which actually proves that, that Brexit stoked anti-immigrant ra racism, because since Brexit's been a success... <laughs> Well, fear can, of immigration can, can I, has, has, has wait, okay. fear of immigration has fallen to its lowest level since the financial okay. crash. For people think Brexit's dealt with immigration, we don't have to worry about it anymore, and we can actually start thinking about all the good things that the immigrants okay. did. So, okay, so one thing you said that that the Leave campaign stoked fear. I think that's rich coming from a Remainer. The Remain campaign <laughs> campaign stoked fear. Did let's, Remain let's, stoke fear of immigration? Let's, no. let's talk about this, what you call about this spike in hate crime. In 2016 and 17, there were 14,500 prostitutes 
prosecutions for hate crimes. That is 7% down on the previous year. Yes, the, one of the reasons that the figures appear to have increased and, and not actually have increased is because, or, or not, not necessarily increased, is because the police have found a new way to record crimes. So it might look like there are more, but there aren't mm. necessarily more. Now, this has come out of lots of organisations and lots of posts. So you can't just say there's been the... You know, I, I think the British people get really fed up yes. of being slated as racist. They're bombarded every day by allegations of, 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 of racism. This is one of the most welcoming countries in the world. Good. You look at, you look at France, you. look at France, and you know, they say, oh, the Republic doesn't see colour, the Republic doesn't see where they're coming from. In this country, thank God we do. We are obsessive about it, and so obsessive. We, we take people who come here, we educate them, we give them homes, we give them welfare, we look after them. That's why, that's why everyone wants to come to this country. My, my husband is a migrant. He came here from Bosnia. And, but long before the war. And he says that this is the least racist country he has ever been to in his life. His friends, who during the war were sent to countries like Germany, like France, like Italy, they all encountered vicious, nasty racism. Sure this country is not racist. And it really, doesn't mean we're perfect. People must be getting really sick of being accused of it. OK. Um, so, I... I, I <laughs> there's a... Uh, I grew up... Uh, in the early 90s, um, as you know, Carol, being yeah. uh, chased by neo-Nazi yeah. skinheads um, who were attacking me with hammers and knives and screwdrivers. And uh, I was the Dwayne Brooks of the Stephen Lawrence yeah. analogy there because I had to watch many of my friends stabbed because of the colour of their skin. And uh, I was not stabbed, just like Dwayne Brooks. Um, but many of my friends were put hammers put to their heads and uh, machetes put to their bodies because of the colour of their skin. I was 15 years old. I refer to that as the bad old days of racism. Yeah. I do think that there are two things you've said that are correct. Britain, despite that experience I had, is more welcoming than most continental European yeah. countries. That must be acknowledged. And the second is that they, they, they were the bad old days of racism. Certain progress has been made. Uh, we now have a British-Pakistani mayor of London. I could never have dreamed yes. at the same time as that happening that we'd have a British-Pakistani home secretary. I think it's important <clears throat> that we acknowledge and give credit where credit is due. Otherwise, when we do raise serious concerns about racism, uh, that is re-rearing its ugly head across Europe, yeah. uh, that those concerns aren't taken seriously if we keep crying wolf. So I try very hard to give credit where credit is due, um, even though, of course, they're both from different ends of the political spectrum. But it's diversity in, in action right there with Sajid Javed and Sadiq Khan. Um, but just, I think this week, Yasmin Ali by Brown, was talking about the royal marriage and you know she has her views but she's got the right to those uh, small R republican views and nadine doris yeah she responded, said be nice oh, yes. no she didn't say be nice oh, she yeah. said more than that you should be Carol. grateful she said she actually implied yeah. that yasmin should be uh, uh, grateful and stop complaining because this country has given her everything and I, I just find that i find that this approach to uh, to, to basically telling people that are of color who have some uh, criticisms that they are political criticisms, whether at the monarchy That's or the not system. What just, was saying. Yeah. No, 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 no yeah, I'm talking about Nadine. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But that, I don't and, necessarily. So I'm just, why, should... I'm, why I'm saying we have to be vigilant is because it can rear its head yeah, again. I wouldn't derail Carol's yeah. argument because of what yeah. Nadine Doris says in yeah. one tweet. The yeah, broad thrust or the central yeah. point of Carol is that this country is very welcoming. I agree. Yeah. With that. If we look at the yeah. last names, the yeah. three of the yeah. panel sitting around it, there's a clue that it probably is. There's no dispute there. Yeah, yeah. All I'm saying is we need to be vigilant that it doesn't rear its head again because in continental Europe at the moment, why was laughed at and ridiculed for saying that? People. People you were saying, you know, hey, he's got his head in the sand, he's Michael's, not saying stuff. I agree with the content of his speech, like Rachel. I agree with what was said in terms of the content That's of the words. Kind of I hate reported. identity politics, but I just think it's unfortunate that he was the guy that said it because of the Brexit campaign. I agree with Rachel there. I found it quite ironic, Carol, that you're saying Britain is no longer racist at the same time as talking about our dark-skinned duchess. I think, you know... What am I supposed to I say? Just, mixed I race just, duchess? I just found what that I really uncomfortable. What should I say? Honest. What I, should I say? Right, let it, let it I just don't know why you referred to her that way. Because the whole of the debate around the wedding was about the colour of her skin and the fact that she's so mixed race. So I was race, very positive which about I the royal wedding, even though I'm not usually um, a big monarchist. I've always respected the fact that people feel emotion about the royal, the royal family because I, I understand identity and I think for many people they represent cultural continuity, which is part of their sense of belonging. And I respect that because in my life I've searched a lot for a sense of identity and I didn't personally find it in the royal family, partly because I think they perpetuated this idea that there's something inherently white about British identities. On the question about racism, I think we're misunderstanding what racism is. You've taken racism as a thing that people do, you know, a prejudice that they get accused of. 
To me, that's not what racism is. It's, it's not. It's, it's, it's an not, attitude. It's not I a set of that's personal not what characteristics. But you said British people are sick of being accused of being well, racist. Well, they are, because well, they're not. When I talk about racism, I'm not accusing individual people. And there are racist people, as you've agreed. We all know yes. there are. Magic got beaten up by them growing up, or watched his friends get beaten up by them. My interest isn't really in them. My interest is in how, as a society, we structurally discriminate and treat unfairly people based on their race. And that is what report after report, whether commissioned by David Cameron, Theresa May, um, Tendai Uchami, the uh, UN uh, envoy who came here and, and special rapporteur and but found let's, let's that since Brexit, about structural that. racism has got right, worse. Let's so talk about that special, that special rapporteur who came across mm. to, to actually do a report. Mm. She was here for all of 11 days. She spoke ex exclusively to pressure groups and then she went home again. After 11 days, she decided that this country had normalised racism. Windrush. I'm sorry, that's just yeah, not... Windrush. Windrush. Just I want to just again... You made yourself about, mm. the victim in this scenario. I was so... It's about you being sick of being accused of being racist. No, I said the British people Sorry, are sick of it. I, I, I was, I, you know, there's another area where I just want to give credit where credit is due. I was so furious when that Windrush scandal erupted. Yeah. But actually, what I found heart in and what I found solace yeah, we was the yeah. actually unified reaction yes. from across the political lines mm. of disgust and abhorrence at what had happened. Yeah. And so I think there is some solace to be found in the way in which this country uniformly, whether Conservative, Labour or anything else in between, sounds like gender, doesn't it, <laughs> well, reacted just, in response yeah. to that Windrush scandal. I was which, proud of us. Well, so, so, that. I mean, the fact that it us. happened, though, is a terrible thing. And yeah. so that, that's why I keep saying we and, must remain vigilant. And there's vigilant. a reason why it happened. Yeah, there is. And, and the reason is related to Carol's topic. That's why is vigilance that, is crucial. Was yeah. that immigration has been weaponised against yeah. people of colour. It's not a coincidence yeah. that it was yeah, black yeah, and brown right. people who were being able to get into where that happened. There is unanimity across the panel on that, but we must move on. You're watching The Pledge on Sky News. Up next, why I've got Nick in my sights. <laughs> In the Bond franchise, women exist mainly to have sex with 007, then die a violent death. No longer. Now the heroes of the summer season of spy capers and thrillers are heroines. Maybe soon we might even have a villain saying... Bond, we've been <laughs> expecting you. For your eyes only, darling. <laughs> Bond. Jane Bond. <laughs> Inevitably followed by a mini furore, <laughs> which is what must happen whenever a beloved character has their ethnicity or gender changed by a new casting. A non-Latina actress has withdrawn from playing Maria in West Side Story. Hermione Granger in the Harry Potter play cannot be black. What nonsense this is. We've always had fluid and creative casting since actors first trod the boards in ancient Greece. Make-believe is at the heart of theatre, not political correctness. Of course a black woman can play a white man in Shakespeare, as I saw in Julius Caesar at the Bridge, and vice versa. Idris Elba would make a fantastic bond. Colourblind and genderblind casting must cut every which way. That's showbiz now, folks. <laughs> This is fascinating, um, and uh, what I'm about to say, as long as it doesn't get me shot by the gun you just have there, <laughs> Not Jane that Bond. Uh, <laughs> the no, Hamlet at the Globe have adopted a gender-fluid cast. Um, uh, Noma uh, uh, Demerswini, who played Hermione Granger in the Harry Potter stage production, of course, as you mentioned, was black, and many fans assumed that Hermione was white, leading to a J.K. Rowling intervention on social media, telling her fans that all she stipulated was that Hermione had curly hair. Of course, Noma went on to win the Olivier award for that precise production and so of course it can be done it's fantastic not in bond when elba yeah. idris elba was suggested as bond of course anthony horowitz said he was why couldn't idris too street no 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 problem no a woman as well. oh, yeah, so i'm gonna say before okay. actually no problem. So, oh, yeah, okay. before i just want to say before i uh, open up to why people don't think it can be bond or not i just want to uh, there, there is a caution that i would advise all of us to keep in mind and that is that there are 
uh, there are un there is underrepresentation going on actually sure. on the stage at the moment, and as long as this is done in a way that doesn't further that color blindness and gender blindness should be the ideal. But if it and it is the case at the moment that only thirty percent, thirty seven percent of main characters in Hollywood productions are women, and out of those sixty eight percent are white, yeah. then we just have to be a bit concerned that this, this is done in a way that still results in equitable and fair representation. So if, if a role was specifically written, for example. Uh, for a person of a certain specific gender or uh, ethnicity, um, then it would probably be just probably be a, make a bit more sense in the current status where we have underrepresentation to try and cast for that role first to see if we can find the actor. Rachel, it's a fantasy. Oh, it's what, a what, film. What's a fantasy? It's more than 50 years old. Every man wants to be with Bond. Every woman wants to be with Bond. That is the whole idea. Yeah, every man he wants has to be Bond. Every man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll maybe do that again. No, Every man no, wants no. to be like James Keep Bond. Every woman wants to be it. like that with James Bond. This is a man who has the physical strength to fight off half a dozen KGB agents, then jump in an aircraft, <laughs> then have a little bit of ladies and gentlemen under a snow rug with some beautiful woman who then gets poisoned by a crazed Korean assassin. It just goes like that. Much as you support, it's like a statue. Well, let's accept that it was written at that time. Yeah. I don't give a damn whether he's white or whether he's black, but you cannot have a female Bond. That's part of the fantasy. And lastly, a bloke looks at Bond and thinks, God, I wish I could fight like him. I wish I could play golf like him. I wish I could fly an aircraft like him. I wish I could have ladies and gentlemen like him. And that's why it can't be a woman. I'm glad you pointed at me when you said it looks like Bond. No, it's probably the most the compelling case I've heard so far for what Rachel's arguing. <laughs> I mean, really. Like, you've just brought back the 1950s. That's actually. where it's set. No, that's, that is where why, it's set. That's not everyone's fantasy. That, that is the whole, to go that, back to a time when fantasy. your greatest aspirations of women is that you might get under those fur, yeah. those, those, those yeah. uh, furry uh, yeah, sheets that's or right, whatever an, it is. An old leopard or something. Uh, let me tell you about Leo. Ringer. Leo Ringer is an actor who was cast in the Royal Shakespeare Society production of The Fantastic Follies of Mr. Rich. Uh, he's a great actor. I've seen him in action myself. Now, he was on the receiving end of a review by none other than Quentin Letts, my old friend, who said that Leo Ringer is too cool, too mature, not chinless or daft or funny enough was he cast because he's black? If so, the RSE's clunking approach to politically correct casting has again weakened its stage product. I suppose its managers are under pressure from the Arts Council to tick inclusiveness boxes. But at some point, they're going to have to decide if their core business is drama or social engineering. There's more. In the, and then Leo Ringer replied to that, saying, and this is, I want you to listen carefully. In the early years of my <laughs> career, he said, I mainly witnessed actors of colour, like myself, in stereotypical roles such as servants and criminals rather than leading parts let him finish there was never any casting that could be considered as inclusive let's made an extended and unforgivable racial slur against no, me I'm and my fellow actors of take one sentence. and i agree I, so do i this is about a woman playing bond not a black i have no problem with but a black Rachel's fella being argument bond. is about no, it's jane, jane bo read the title it's no. jane okay there was bond. a cute little stunt but that, the I general think argument is about gender my, and race I think you all mis misunderstood my argument i slightly disagree with Madge as well because I don't think you should necessarily cast the person who f I, you, we want the best person for the part whether yep. they're black yep. white and male no, or female. That's you're wrong. No, I'm not. White, yes. Leave Bond. Leave Bond aside. <laughs> but what we Why want... are you dressed like that? <laughs> <laughs> Hide the gun, right? No, but. The, I agree. And the know, point is, we, Leo Ringer was cast in that role uh, because he I'm was the best actor. Words. He was the best actor. It's not race. Exactly. Just cast the best person, which exactly. is why if you want to have a white person playing Maria, if she is the best person and she's not Puerto Rican, she should be allowed yeah, to play the that. role. The problem what with that is, the problem? is that, is that with actors I want, I want gold finger have with, historically with been over. I kind of... I thought that yeah. woman was very gracious, Sienna uh, yeah. Burgess, I think yeah. she was. I thought she was very gracious. She stood aside. She said, as an artist, I should have realised that that role but Natalie been filled Wood is by... in Puerto Rican, well, and she played the role in the movie. But, but no, but my my point is that you uh, know, actually this are... is what you so you agree with that then? That's really good. No, that's with, with, yeah. with with so, yeah, with with things that are if, if a Latino, if it's a story about a Latino, female, get, yes, get a Latino because there, yeah. there are plenty of Latino yeah. actors and actresses around. But you know, my my general point on this our, our the, is a theatre manager's job. To give us good drama, or to, yes. or to be socially engineering, and that's not this is all about. You've You're talked about right, a clunking Carol. approach. You're this is a clunking right. approach to diversity. Hang on, he's got a problem with gender. Why would you have? Why would you have, why would you have a heck? woman <laughs> playing a man when there's plenty of blokes around, and vice versa? Why would if you make straight theatre? It makes great theater, it makes you might want to do that. You might want to do that. But my issue is the assumption that if you cast a black person as Leo Ringer was cast, the assumption by Quentin Letts that he was only cast to be politically correct. The assumption that it's not just that he was the best person, which is the wrong. 
Royal Shakespeare Society said, we but cast we him. Yeah, but that he is the best that, that, so that is Rachel's point. We're, we're, we're trampling yeah. on historical accuracy with a lot yeah. of drama. In that thing, it's Troy... Drama. OK, that, that, yeah, but it's supposed to be convincing. In that thing, Troy, the rise and fall of a city, yeah. they, they cast part the, uh, of supposedly Greek, blonde, blue-eyed warriors. They cast black men in there that There are loads room. of Africans in ancient Greece, uh, Carol. What's this got to do with Jane Bond? It's a bit more... You missed the plot here. My point is a very simple one. Gender fluid we're talking about. Gender fluid. If, for if a black basically. man can play a white woman on stage, which yeah. is what we're seeing, yeah. I saw yeah. Julius Caesar where Casca was played by a black woman. He was a white man. Yeah. I, I, my argument is a white well, man should be able that? to play a black woman. It's got to cut both why? ways. We can't sit around and say we have to cast according so to race. Ideal. No, you've got to do it. This is the black quality has historically yeah. been overlooked. Yes, and I know. Film and what do we do about that? They have no not been I agree. I so agree. if you now start giving the few roles that were designed for them to <laughs> white actors, you're not achieving just, the that, desired that's goal. That's theatre. That's showbiz. Nick just wants to talk about that. I understand what you're saying. You only care about that. You just published all the movies. OK. Right. Before we we go, there's just time for this. No bride wants to have their thunder stolen on their wedding day. But just as Pippa Middleton stole some of the attention on Kate's wedding day, Meghan Markle also had to share the limelight last weekend. Before he got to his feet, nobody had heard of Bishop Michael Curry, but his sermon ended up being one of the most memorable bits of the whole day. And let me tell you something. Old Solomon was right in the Old Testament. That's fire. They are de Shadon, and with this, I will sit down. We've got to get you all married. <laughs> Bishop Michael Curry, you are our undisputed straight talker of the week. He, 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 he went he on. Bit, he, he did he go on. on. 13 he minutes. Me that was he the bought, shortest Chris, black church sermon I've yeah. ever yeah. heard. I, was, <laughs> I, was, I, I tweeted at the time, he brought Christianity back into Christianity. That's what he did. Yeah. No, the worst thing he, he was, was saying, Grace, at the reception, they never got the food out. <laughs> Fire and brimstone. That's it for this week. But thanks for tuning in. And don't forget, you can join in the debate by searching for The Pledge on Facebook or Twitter. See you next time. <laughs>